Welcome to Monarchist Minute Royalist News in the U.S. of A. I'm Victor Smith. Tonight, we will discuss the the establishing of a Republic of Barbados with the election of its first president. We will also discuss unitar a unitary form of government versus fe a federalist form of government. And we will discuss how we would reform the military if we would at all. But first, today in Rome, President Biden met with Pope Francis and had a per Biden 75 minute long discussion officially about the environment and President Biden had some choice remarks about what Pope Francis said to him. His Holiness said that the president could receive Holy Communion or should receive Holy Communion. And he also, and the president upon arriving to the Vatican said something very stupid about the Pope calling into question his mental sanity unless it was a joke. To discuss all of these things, we have our panel, John Ornes, Charles York, and our special guest for tonight, Darth Gilhoon, William Stout is otherwise occupied this evening. We will start with Charles York. Uh, okay, I, I didn't hear anything about the, about Joe Biden calling the Pope senile or anything like that. But, no, uh, that, 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 that's not what I said. Oh, okay. I was, I was, okay. What did you say? Because you got it back. back I up. said when I said at the introduction, Joe Biden said, I'm a big fan of yours. You're like the famous African American pitcher in baseball. Or oh, something. oh, oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. That's, that's even, that's even, oh, God. Uh, well, at least, no. at least, oh, uh, you know, okay. I can't, I can't really fault. Joe Biden for something that's beyond his control. Okay, like a declining mental state isn't really something we choose because otherwise we would all be, you know, our minds would be running, you know, peak efficiency until we die. But it just, I mean, that just calls it to question why. I mean, everybody has their moments. Like there was, there was this, there was this video I watched of, um, of, uh, was a Bush Jr. making fun of himself by, by, uh, by quoting some of his, um, I don't know. Some somebody had marked it, wrote down a bunch of like weird gaffes or whatever that Bush Jr. had, uh, you know, written down into like a book, and he and he quoted from it. Uh, so <laughs> you know things like, uh, and the most important question is: Are children learning? But there's a difference between that and okay, the Pope. He doesn't even look. He doesn't even look black. <laughs> I don't. How would you? How would you? I don't. I don't know. And then for my thoughts on the whole conversation as a whole, and I need to lower my voice because the high pitched voice that I do sounds really annoying. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the whole thing, it's just, I don't know. I, it's, it's sort of hard because people are like, oh, you're Catholic. Well, why, why do you support the Pope? Well, it's like, firstly, he's the Pope, but secondly, uh, this doesn't really make it okay, but it's, I don't know. I don't think that Pope Francis is like, the worst pope, or even necessarily, <sighs> I wouldn't call him the best pope. But hey, maybe time will tell. I don't know. It's it's so weird going to, I guess, criticize the pontiff. But he did get Junipero Serra canonized. So Serra canonized. So, um, yay. I d I don't I don't really know what to say other than my disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. I I just uh, that that's I don't know I I guess I'll pass it over to Boss Man, John. All right. Oh man, I, it's just par for the course with Biden. I mean, I don't know. It it just I've just become desensitized to it all. Um, we went from an angry man to an old man to like a senile man. So I don't know. Or no, we went from an angry man to a sleeping man, and I don't know. We're so far away from. You know, coronations and stuff like that. Really, really high stake stuff. Now we have presidents making very racially insensitive jokes towards the pontiff. I don't know what's happening most of the time uh, with him. Um, 
he's really good at making racially insensitive jokes from what I've heard about him. Um, well, at least at least we know Sleepy Man's uh, ice cream choice. We don't know Orange Man's favorite ice cream choice. We, we so, know it's no. McDonald's choice, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm just kind of. This, this just makes me more and more want a monarchy. I tell you every day, it's just nonsense. And everybody, it's like a stupid, it's like a circus, but everybody plays into it. Mm. I it's, and I think we need to, we need to make the, we need to break the gig up because this is just nonsense. Uh, and, not not to. Uh, not to butt in, but I just I did just remember this, and I actually read this to both Victor and um, Darth Kloon today, but I won't quote it from you, but it's um, from Father John Locke's Church History, and uh, he talks about the coronation of Charlemagne and how the Western Empire, after like an absence of like 300 years, was reborn when when Charlemagne was you know you know coronated, and you know he had the rebirth of the Western Empire and thus a Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. um, and it and it sort of talked about how this this vision of a truly christian empire with the the pope at its spiritual head who was partnered but ultimately you know the pope was the one who would do the coronation so therefore i guess was in charge being you know had the emperor who's supposed to be the defender of the church and this holy empire against all temporal enemies and you know, you you have this beautiful, you know, Im it's that's that's kind of a beautiful image, you know, that that the entire you know Christian world being ultimately under you know one emperor and different you know kings and and the like. Um, but I think yeah, and just look at that now. <laughs> look at the well. Firstly, the holy the the the. There is no Holy Roman Emperor currently coordinated because Napoleon kind of put a put an interim on the whole thing, and it's I mean the Church has largely ever since the destruction of the Papal States the Church has sort of become less interested in having a direct hand or encouraging people to have a direct hand in ecclesiastical matters I mean temporal matters it's just you know I mean it's I mean don't get me wrong this is this in the grand scheme of Church history this is um a very small interlude between the destruction of the papal states and, and the present. Um, I just think just... everything's become less and less. I mean, the religious stuff side, of course, I agree with you. Um, now, now was the HRE always the greatest thing on the world in the world? Absolutely oh, no. not. Um, I do think a divine consent in a way just as the consent of the governed, I think consent of the divine is is, it is very, very, very important. And I think, uh, of course, now when you look at the Showa, or not Showa, the Meiji Constitution with Japan, you had some semblance of that where you could actually have a divine constitution of sorts. Um, but I don't think that's ever, I don't think that ever really... I don't think it, I think there's enough wiggle room for both. I mean, obviously, you can have struggles for the rights of man and epic these epic stories about monarchs in the present day, and you don't need you don't need to kill off the monarch in a way that we've done over the past few hundred years. And and what we've got now is, and we'll get into more, you know, the fall of monarchies later. In the last topic, but I don't know. It's just nonsense. It, you know, the president right. goes over right. after spending moving thirty on. years jumping back and forth, back and forth. It's just nonsense. Okay. All right, well, moving on. Darth. Well, doesn't Darth and uh, you need to get your piece in? I'm, I mean, I, I'm technically not supposed to comment on uh, the oh, senile no, no, no. old man. Yeah, you absolutely did. All not right, all right, all right. He can't. Of course. So moving on. Hey, Chris, no. yeah. Oh wait, you. Need you want to say anything about it, Victor? Um, what I was going to say has probably already been said. So moving on. Oh yeah, okay. The <clears throat> the military and how we would potentially restructure it. And for this, we have brought on Darth Kilhoon, a military expert. So Darth, you have. I think you can start. Yeah, start by how the military works, and then. You, have, you have the floor for however long you want. 
And uh, and we say expert uh, in terms of he's an active duty soldier. Comparatively speaking. So, yes. Sir yeah, Don Calhoun, you have the floor. Take as long as you want. Oh, all right. Um, so currently, I'd say how the military works in the short run is the federal government decided to make them all departments. And by that extent, they wanted them to all operate like bureaucracies. Oh. So in especially ever since World War II, all of them have taken that liberty of acting like a bureaucracy in every shape and manner, unlike a true formal military structure like you would see over in Europe, where the military is kind of like more the spiritual spiritual embodiment of the nation. And that's something that the United States definitely is kind of lacking. Like we have this false astroturfed kind of spirit of the military where it's like, oh yeah, we wave the flag around on Veterans Day and ah oh, yeah, we celebrate the Army's birthday every now and then, but yeah. And I think the Marine the Marine Corps recently had their birthday, I believe, too. I I, f I forget exactly what day theirs is on. But essentially we have we have a military there, but it's not the spirit of the nation that guides it. Which is mostly its downward factor, and why it's actually much a, especially today, a, a place of sin and debauchery. I would say a lot more because a lot of more of the junior members are encouraged by um, their senior staff to act premis promiscuously um, and just. Uh, it's kind of a meme for junior enlisted to always be going to the bars, shit phase, showing up for PT in the morning. It just expected, and that's kind of sad that that's our standards these days. I'm like a, I, I admire especially more German style army structures where it's just the more spirit of the nation. You're expected to live up to a dignity that's intrinsic to your ancestors. So um, that's the spiritual essence. The you can kind of say of my Julius Evola take on the U.S. military sickness right now. Um, yeah, any any specific points you want to hammer on? Um, I guess, uh, you know, ignoring the sad and crippling nature that's kind of brought me half to tears about the, you know, spiritual reality of the military. Um, how, how exactly do you think the... I guess the how would you describe in the simplest terms the hierarchy itself in in I guess specifically the army because that's what you are but just in the military in general and how does it compare? Well, well, the military has this sickness of all democracies where it believes that education is your only um, achievement in life and having fancy degrees from universities determines um, their leadership potential, which is a complete falsity in all reality so like all of our officer corps has to have a bachelor's degree of some kind and that could literally be an underwater basket weaving um long um a uh, long boat rowing yeah it's you can you can have a bachelor's degree in anything and it will qualify you to be an officer in the military mm -hmm. which is something that is fundamentally just a broken system like in most of our nato allies that is not a thing um, you mostly have to attend either a war academy or you are selected from the enlisted ranks like in Germany today. Um, in fact, in Germany, you are there's you take two routes in the Bundeswehr. You either go down the NCO, NCO route or non-commissioned officer where you're like a team leader, squad leader, more ground level. Or if you're especially a high achievement soldier, they're most likely going to send you to a war academy to become an officer. Which I, I assume it wasn't always this way uh, that you had to have a bachelor's degree. How recent is that? Because that just sort of seems stupid um, and modern. 1960s. Um, it course. came out. It of came out it during Vietnam. Recent. Yeah, it, it's always the 60s that ruins everything. Um, like we actually had quality officers. I would say like World War II and down. Um, but after that, they just kind of petered out because. Our standard used to be you either came from uh, the Citadel or West Point or one of these academies. Um, and occasionally you came from the enlisted ranks if you were a high achievement soldier that was 
recommended for OCS. Like you didn't have to have a degree or anything. You were just recommended for it. So like yeah, I think that's who... a much better way to operate. Just a, just a little point of note here. The Citadel was not, I don't believe the Citadel was ever a full military academy like West Point or Annapolis. Well, yeah, yeah, no, officially it's not, but unofficially, um, many of their members do end up going into the officer corps, um, especially back in the day when their credentials would get you a commission in the military upon graduation. So how would you, like, let's just say, for example, you were, you, by some, by some mechanism or miracle or something like that the president asks you to completely redesign the military and you get full reign <laughs> what, what would you do so one we'd be pretty defenseless for a while because i'd got a i would have a huge purge of the officer corps um and some purge of the nco corps especially the more careerist ncos that don't really that are more nihilist than anything and I don't want that in my ranks. I prefer actual competence against bureaucratic uh, chokeholding. So one, I would open up more military academies, and I would make it more open for selection, like, and drop the whole you have to be recommended by Congress to go to one of these fancy academies because uh, that's a that's a very high bar to meet. Um, and it and frankly, what, and, yeah, my big thing is what does congress have to do with anything <laughs> like yeah, I, I that, that, that's also my point i'm very uh, prussianist yeah. when it comes to the military where the military is a state within the state it operates like, like its own nation um separate that's, from the public government no i think i think it should exist as almost as an extension of the executive branch with the monarch being the commander in chief well of course he can kind well, of give yeah. that out to his I mean, that's, heirs. that's that's part of the titles that goes along with being the monarch you are yeah. um you are chief of the armed forces you are um a king or whatever title you are um but and, in a way you know the monarch the executive branch or what i dub as the imperial branch would kind of be a more private branch of the government as opposed to um the more public branches like the legislative branch and the judicial well, yeah, so that's, in a way, that, just, that would work. I mean, that's how all monarchies function. Like, I I always bring up the German Empire because it's frankly like one of my favorite sis, my favorite systems to point yeah, to. I, as yeah, a, I've been looking into the German Empire, the the early constitution, semi constitutional Japanese Empire, and like the way they manage semi constitutional monarchism is just right on the dot of what we need to not directly copy, but of course take notes on. Well, yeah, it w it was that old idea that um, all these different extensions of the government are, and they they work in allegiance based upon their allegiance to the monarch. Like the the na the army and the, like, if you're talking about Japan's case, the army and the navy were not under the same command staff. They operate as two separate um, forces, but they both owe owed loyalty to the emperor. And then that was the same with the government. It, the government and the military branches were all separate from each other, but they all answered to the emperor. And that's I think kind it's of kind of ironic that both semi, both notable semi-constitutional monarchs, monarchs have ended. Our monarchies have ended in military dictatorship, essentially, which is something we need to avoid, of course. But like, I mean, yeah, that's it, it, so. It depends talking about on military which one you're talking about. To me, yeah. um, like the. The whole German Empire, it turned into a pseudo-military mm -hmm. dictatorship, but it wasn't uh, full-fledged because the, the Reichstag only had as much power as essentially the Kaiser believed it had. So that's why it had much less power under Wilhelm than it did under, well, Wilhelm II compared to Wilhelm I, because the German constitution didn't really give a whole lot of distinguished powers to the Reichstag and only had a bunch of theoretical powers given to it. All right. And speaking of powers, unless you have anything more to add about our military structure, Darth? Um, I mean, well, 
I mean, I could add a little bit more. Um, first off, I would keep I would keep the idea of um, uh, like there's this thing, especially in the army, where each corps has its own culture. The infantry. Oh yeah, the I love that idea. Yeah, the infantry, the engineers, the artillery. Um, the spirit of the corps is very unique. Like I'm an army engineer, so we're the builders of the army, and we're the we're the ones that keep the infantry safe on the battlefield, essentially. And we are we nobly call ourselves the kings of the castle, which I'd probably I'd probably redub it more like the guardians Irony. of the castle, but um and also also infantry call themselves queens of the battlefield. <laughs> so um we, we, we use a, ironic yes, queen. We, we use we <laughs> oh, use God. a lot we use a lot of um uh, royal pseudonyms in the military, even though we're not a royal army, which is it's yeah, hilarious because I'm, them up, you so know, speak, you it's know. almost like these ideas are somewhat intrinsically linked. Yes, I, I bring this up too, um, and I tend to actually get a lot of agreement from the more educated NCOs um, <laughs> that actually yeah, have a all hail the president, long live the president. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, also, I would have a more... I would probably also gut a lot of the Marine Corps for all as Marines listening. I don't hate you guys. It's just saying um, uh, making you more like you, especially in the last few decades, have just turned into the Army 2.0. Oh, and, yeah. And you, you, your guys' job is naval infantry. That, that, is your, that is your role. And that is distinguishedly part of the Navy. But you've tried to separate yourself, and I would kind of like force you back into that role of being the naval infantry and the Army being the sole land dominance force in the U.S. again. And the, that would also, like, I would fix the budget around because, one, the Army and the Marines, we don't get enough money for what we actually need to do to be operational. Um, well, one, some of that gets messed up in bureaucratic nightmare, but most of it is just because the Air Force and the Navy end up choking up the majority of the budget when the Air Force wastes it on brand new barracks and overpaying their staff with um, there's like the base pay, but then there's other types of pay that you get to, and the Air Force likes to show out that other types of pay that gets added on all the time. So it's literally just money being wasted when the other branches yeah, think, use that. Yeah. I think, it's like you said earlier, you know, bureaucracies are stupid. <laughs> like, well, yeah, that, that's also the problem. That's the problem in having uh, the Congress give us our budget is because they frankly only look at us at a surface level. They're like, well, we want a bunch more F thirty five, so we're gonna pump the Air Force full of money. Oh, we want a brand <laughs> new, we want a brand new aircraft carrier. Oh, um, I'm gonna tell what what happened with the F thirty five recently after I talk about the aircraft carriers. It's like thirteen billion dollars for an aircraft carrier. I think that's like the new Gerald R Ford. Yeah, and the Congress just keeps on shilling money for. We have twenty of these things. We we don't need more aircraft carriers, guys. Well, well I mean, actually, um, because. The Navy, I just, I've, I, I've always um, loved and admired the Navy before I figured out what they are in more modern times. But uh, the thing is, is that I think we have 11, 12, or 13 fleet carriers currently in operation. Uh, but the ones, besides the Gerald Dart Ford itself, all of them are approaching like 50. And that's their, the, the Nimitz class's lifespan was 50. And it's like, so all this money we pumped into the Ford, the Ford project, and we only have one finished, one or two under construction, and the and the other ones aren't even. We don't even know yet. Well, yeah, that's because the Navy refuses to decommission the older Nimitz class vessels, um, and they prefer to keep them on operation, which. That would alleviate a ton of money for them to put towards actually constructing the new ship. In fact, we could sell the old Nimitz class to a to a more um, a developing military or one of our NATO allies, yeah. and we could we could make a well, we wouldn't make a profit on it by far, but we would at least make something on it. Yeah, and and also. Um... Obviously, mothballing still you still have to pay to mothball it because you still have to do a bare minimum. But I don't. I mean, unless it's like World War Three, I don't under. I don't necessarily see why we need all of them in operation, anyways. Well, like, yeah, exactly. It's the 
like the entire world together has like 40 aircraft carriers and what we we hold 20 of them yeah it's I, I mean, it's insane no i mean i mean i understand the need to maintain a larger carrier fleet than everybody else but you have to understand that some of those aircraft carriers that aren't ours are our allies like great britain has their queen elizabeth the french Japan. have something oh well technically they're not aircraft carriers we can't call well, them that te- because... technically <laughs> but um uh, uh, japan japan totally didn't buy a bunch of f-35s to um uh, do vertical takeoffs off of them <laughs> but, uh, Wait, that's something the f-35 could do yeah, that that's part of its design. Although, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the audience about what the F-35 um, issue is right now. Right now, um, all of our F-35s are sitting ducks. They can't use their weapon systems because the software drivers to operate the weapon systems have not been developed. Oh my god, man! <laughs> that's an SNL sketch waiting to happen, man. <laughs> so, so all all like, these oh no, we're about to get sunk. Fire the guns. We can't. <laughs> Why this? The software doesn't work, guys. <laughs> I, oh, just to, like, could it? If, <laughs> at the very least, couldn't you Jerry rig strapping some fifty calibers and doing some manual thing like that's the nineteen forties? At the very oh my gosh! But it's too heavy. But the computer said no, man. The computer said no. You can't code that, dude. I mean, I understand, because, you know, we have all these, you know, precision-guided bombs that kind of need computers, but, like, if they can't, what's the well, point if they can't of declaring work, these what's ready the to... Freaking point, dude? What? I, we we I mean, spend so many millions on each plane, really? and, I, and, and the software's not even ready. <laughs> that's like, that's like, that's like me buying, that's like me buying a brand new, that's like me buying a brand new car. And they're saying, "Oh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a software update so you can use the brakes." <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's. I mean, that's just. I mean, that's funny. Okay, it's it's funny. It, I mean, no. Okay, it, it's funny it's because we're not. Funny. We don't need to use these F thirty fives right now. It's funny because we don't need to use them. If this was like. I don't know. If this was World War II, nobody would have ever accepted these into service because you know you can't shoot them. Yeah, it's it's purely a peacetime military, which is also the the awful thing because especially in peacetime you get the career winches on in the oh, military. Dude. And they're they're <sighs> only out for their retirement pension. And I'm like, honestly, with the way like the United States inflation is going and just this current regime, I I'm not supposed to technically comment on the regime, but I think that um, their retirement pensions may not be coming through. I'm sorry, <laughs> 20 year retirees. Uh, you know, this... I, you know, it's just, and this is what this is what I truly love about monarchism is the monarch truly prospers when there's no war going on. With a republic, we've built up a military industrial complex, and it just keeps growing. And growing, and especially oh, now, oh, you, you want to more hey. and more and more and more and more. And boom, so, you know, boom, you, you want to hear we're something running something that's a great example of, of the military industrial complex at work and like the ground level military. <laughs> so, sure. so, um, uh, my, my job, I have to end up working with mechanics a lot in the army, and um, uh, my mechanic, my motor sergeant, um, one time told us that he had to throw out unused motor oil because of a contract. Oh, boy. Just uh, just completely unused motor oil because of the contract. He had to dispose of it so that way it looked like he used it all up. It, he, and he couldn't have just, like, handed it to... I don't know. Like, put it on the side of a road and said, free motor like, oil, please take. He actually had to get rid of it. Yep, you have to officially dispose of it. Or I, yep. <laughs> this is what happens when you get when you get Congress a bunch of ladies and gentlemen, idiots a po- like a po- hey. a poli- ladies and gentlemen, the politicians' military. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. You want Harry Reid to manage your military <laughs> funds? Please, you know, by all means, go ahead. You want Mitch McConnell to be the one who decides where your military dollars go? Okay. Congratulations, I mean, we did. It. We did it. You know, we did it. We made the perfect military on the planet. Guys, it's over. There's no contest. 
<laughs> our no, entire mean... military structure is being funded by a bunch of politicians. Congratulations. Okay, I, I, I kind of was reminded while we were talking about this. So, um, original, the reason I think that the M1 Grand, uh, the you know, our iconic World War II rifle, only had eight rounds in it was because originally it was to be chambered in something closer to an intermediate cartridge called 276 that the military was working on. And um, the MacArthur basically said, like, the soldiers liked it who got to try it out. Everybody liked it. But MacArthur said, okay, no. Right, because we already have massive stockpiles of thirty out six, and the budget, and the, and also presumably, and I'm not sure if this is part of his reasoning. If you were to change, uh, the you know change over to this new caliber for the rifle, you would also have to change over it for the BAR and everything else in the military that used the thirty out six cartridge, and the military didn't have the budget for that at the time. I get the feeling that what they would have done now is switched over to the new caliber. And then just dumped the rest of the stockpile into the sea. <laughs> oh. no, no, it, no, we would have airdropped it into a gun's a, a gun. Air. Like, come on now, guys, a gun's mm. a gun. I mean, no, guns. I mean, there, I mean, there's, I mean, the, the new cartridge, I mean, did have, um, you know, some advantages. But in hindsight, that you know, actually was MacArthur made that call, and that was actually a good one in hindsight because you know, and like World you know, so put a it in reserve, later, save it. Though. You know, what if you just run out of guns one day when you're fighting an intense war? And boom, oh crap, we threw all of our guns into the ocean. Oh, yeah. dang, man. The nation doesn't have that problem because <laughs> our civilians are armed. Well, yeah, but you have oh, to understand yeah. Right. that. Right, yeah, that, that'd well, be yeah, a I great mean, success. No, I mean, the, the thing is, is that well, yeah, um, the military... Oh, we can take their... Oh, yeah, I figured that. The, yeah, the... we're not going to oh, take yeah, your... We are not going to... Don't, don't oh. worry, we are not going to take your arms. We are firm believers no. in the Second Amendment. No, no, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, we, the, we, we hate gun. I hate gun control personally. So no, I mean, I, I we, we all do. I mean, it's, here, but I have a heavy stain for gun control. No, I mean, so, yeah, it, it's it's just I don't know the I don't know. I mean, like I I laugh that that's probably what the military would have done. You know, if if this was if this was present year, you know, we just move everything forward. But yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, of course, MacArthur everything. would ever have been in Actually. somebody like MacArthur never would have been in, in that position of authority, anyways. Like, let's just be brutally honest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, as you a, stars as on a your kind test. of a closer, as kind of a closer, how do you feel, Darth, about more aristocratic uh, military men like Patton and MacArthur? How do you feel about those? Well, they um, aren't aristocrats. Let's just say that. Well, the, the I, aristocratic. I didn't say spirit. they were aristocrats. I said they were aristocratic. They were kind yeah, of, they had that the aristocratic, aristocratic soul. I, I get what you're talking yeah. about. Um, uh, yeah, frankly, um, if you read um, military journals and um, old biographies from old officers, they all have this very aristocratic soul to them. All of them are very well educated mm -hmm. men. All of them are very um, uh, true men of the land. And they, they have that aristocratic soul to them. And you just, I don't see that in officers today. And that's frankly why, like, men are, like, in Afghanistan, we could have had half the casualties if we would have had competent officers. That That's mm -hmm. that's my hot take um, for And additionally, you can, yeah, you can thank MacArthur for the last, for the maintaining of the last emp empire on the planet Earth. Yeah, that's... Because um, if, anybody uh, else, if anybody else would have been in there, uh, they would have probably executed the emperor. Hmm. Well, Probably. yeah, it's it's the um, uh, like an officer has to be aristocratic. It's by his nature. He has to mm -hmm. be able to sacrifice um, men when needed, but also know when to fight his battles. He needs to know how to act like a like a gentleman when needed. He needs to know how to be diplomatic. He knows how to be um, offensive. It's. You you need all these traits, and when you're so reliant to find an officer class is a college degree, you're going to be getting very dim-witted men that haven't been. You're trying to kind of get people who they're, match they're the American facade, you know, the well, good yeah, old ball the, way. Thing. Well, it's the pe <laughs> it's the same style of peasant army that the Red Army had. In all honesty, mm -hmm. it's just the. It just rebranded on like the Soviet Union. They used the same thing. Like they were required, like oh, all of our officers must be well-educated uh, men of the party. Um, 
And that's essentially the same thing where instead of replacing the party, it's like you must have a bachelor's degree um, for America. And that's our version of the party. Well, at least right, the Soviet well, system, you actually did occasionally get a good general who managed to survive one of Stalin's purges. <laughs> Although, yeah. actually, um, there is some, on a slightly historical tangent, there is some evidence to suggest that accidentally Stalin's purges may have actually indirectly helped the Red Army because it, he purged all the old officers who didn't know what the heck to do with tanks. So a lot of the younger officers who were more interested in that sort of thing were in charge but anyways that's just yeah but yet he waxed the guy that came up with deep battle theory which i would have to implement against the Wehrmacht. so (laughs) it's a miracle they survived that war i'm gonna say it right now it's a miracle i'm i mean it was it really a miracle because um it wasn't wasn't very holy that they won yeah i don't know it wasn't holy but i'm saying it was a miracle for them like i wish they would have gotten trounced but yeah, the only good guys in the Eastern Front were the Poles. I, yeah, I, mean, I kind of. It's like my my dad says. Uh, I wish Germany and Russia would have beaten each other to death. Yeah. So moving on now. Yeah, let's go dis- to something else. We will discuss the unitary versus federalism, and to properly introduce this topic, I'll bring in the boss man to do that. Boss man. Oh, okay. Um. So. <laughs> A federal system. So, or, okay. Federal system is essentially what we have with uh, the interplay between states or provinces in our other cases. And the federal government. So you have one federal government and one, or a plurality of state governments. So, yeah. But with a uh, unitary system, or we were joking earlier, unitarian system. No, unitary. Um, there'd be one government. There'd be no, and all subdivisions, in a sense, would be within the hierarchy of the government, of one unitary government. Um, so you wouldn't have divisions, you wouldn't have many governors or many sub-monarchs or anything like that. You would have one monarch or one president. And, yeah, uh, But there can be lower rungs in the hierarchy. So you have China, which is unitary, but there are, there is a governmental hierarchy. So, so yeah, that's a a rough, a rough uh, explanation of unitary versus uh, federal. I'm more of a federalist man myself. I think that each state, to some degree, it would be better for 50 states and one federal government, in my opinion, than one massive governmental structure that would just end up being a lot more bureaucratic than it needs to be. So I'm a, I'm a federalist. I'm kind of in between federalism and anti-federalism. And I'm curious to what you think, Charles. And we'll go down the list. Um, well, I, in once again, I don't think I can go an entire episode without bringing up the fact that I'm a Jacobite. Um, oh yeah, sweet. You know, you know, uh, you know. Hall be king, but chairly. Uh, uh, so, I local liberty. I guess the sort of separation of powers thing. It it's really more if you imagine like the pyramid structure. It's it's and in terms of like you know and the width of the pyramid. I guess the base of the pyramid is how much authority each layer. I guess has. The the city and the county would have a lot more power, and then as you go up the list, there's progressively less power, but then when you get to the monarch, and the monarch specifically, not other aspects of the federal government, the the monarch would have a lot more power, but he would... You know, so I guess the local liberties, I guess, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if this is really technically counts as a rejection of both. I mean, I, I do think that federalism and the concept of certain layers, uh, you know, like the state does certain one thing and the federal government does another thing and the local does, you know, and they don't interact with each other. Mm-hmm. That sort of marble. I think that there is value in that. And I guess I would support that with the exception of it would be the monarch's purview to um, to break that if if the need arises, like if, you know, a state 
elects a bunch of idiots and who don't know anything to you know run the road commission then the pre- then the king is like uh, okay you know what um no okay having a bunch of uh, loop de loops is not is not a good way to build a highway system <laughs> uh, obviously that's like, over exaggerated but you know i guess but in, but in the sense that there are certain things that the city uh can do that can't be infringed upon by the county or the you know state i like that um but also that i also want a more local nobility in that sense so let's say we have dukes because i'm i'm not an emperor guy i'm a king guy uh we have you know dukes in charge of each state that maybe the dukes in a limited capacity could also you know say okay city i know this is technically you know what you're supposed to handle but you guys aren't doing it so i'm i'm stepping in charge um but you know in terms of elected government i i do like the idea that there are cert- the different layers can't just infringe upon other layers but we don't really have that anymore anyway in our current system um you you have there has been recent yeah there yeah, have I been mean, recent it, problems with yeah. the fed enforcing laws and yeah. threatening funding there yeah, has drinking, been a few of this yeah drinking, drinking yeah, that's the main yeah drinking thing, age right? is a perfect example right so technically the states are supposed to decide these things, whether or not, you know, the drinking age is 18, 21, a dr- or they're going to be a Yeah, on state. paper, you know, that is true, that, but Congress yeah, can only for- withhold funding for some reason to yeah. all 50 states if they don't comply, which is yeah. nonsense, in my opinion. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that that's sort of, you know, people forget that, you know, before Prohibition went national, um, Michigan was a dry state, like, a year or two before... Um, before before it went national so there was this story about you know so you know uh i guess rum runners would were trying to you know rush past the uh michigan police and get into michigan and i think the michigan police like either they cheer i think they jerry rigged together like some sort of like armored car or something i don't know it was a really long time ago when i when i read that story in some michigan historical uh magazine that i had for some reason um but you know we don't we don't really have I guess that sort of federalism anyways. And I'm not saying that there aren't times when the federal government where any layer of government can exert a uh, technically not legitimate influence. Uh, because at the end of the day, laws sometimes have to be broken. And, and even though, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of what Aristotle says that laws, generally speaking, shouldn't be laws and customs shouldn't be broken because then people lose respect for laws and customs. Sometimes that is necessary, but the federal government and the other layers of government, when they're meddling with each other, they just do it way too much. But yeah, it you know, but but generally speaking, though, customs and laws uh, shouldn't be broken unless there is a really good reason to. Um, yeah, I guess I'll pass it on to Victor and then to Dark. Okay, so quick programming note, we will still be talking about Barbados, but another topic has just come up, a bit of breaking news from earlier today, we'll get into that, we'll get into that in a minute after we're not done with this topic. Personally, I think that the federalism debate was one of the earliest debates of founding the nation. And I think that if we're going to, like, we are not abiding by our current constitution to begin with, because if the federal government has a lot more power than what our framers wanted it to have. So, in a way, if you go back to what the framers had intended, It would give the states a heck of a lot more power and things would be even more confusing for us today. Now, in a more unitary system, which I would argue we are in the midst of transitioning to, it would be sort of helpful, but yeah, the bureaucratic structure and the size of our nation would absolutely prohibit any kind of unitary structure to form. Now, Darth, this will be the last topic you'll be able to weigh in on because the breaking news topic is a political topic. 
Well, he calls away in Barbados, but that because it's foreign politics, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Oh yeah, I, I am also curious of as a fan of the federal German system. I'm curious as to what you think. I'm kind of in the same boat you are. I really like the idea of that. Um, you're talking to me. Sorry, I had to talk to somebody yeah. for a minute. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, we're still in the unitarian versus federal, and what you think of whatever. Um. Yeah, my thoughts on the whole matter is like my. I think it's because my family had to flee. Um the collapse of the German Empire um, when Weimar was made um, that I'm my family kind of influenced me to admire the German system the most. So I I like the idea that you have the federal monarch, the the king of Prussia and the emperor like you would have one one monarch that's still the monarch of his own territory, but he's also the imperial um, uh the imperial figure over the entire unified um uh, unified empire so it's not like he doesn't own the entire entire um uh, empire per se because that'd be up to the local monarchs um where you How have would you like, think that would work with um america say if a monarch or an emperor a theoretical emperor would own maybe maryland or something and then um, he'd be the king of maryland then i i would think I think, um, uh, you know, I don't really want to violate necessarily old state borders, but yeah. I think a good idea would be a kind of like a Uber District of Columbia, essentially. Mm. Um, can't, I would probably just rename it to Columbia instead of having district in there, because that's a very Masonic mm. term. Um, I don't want to get rid of Mason, Masonic imagery from the nation. Um, I'd probably unify Maryland... DC and Virginia and create like a new kingdom out of that the the kingdom of Columbia and then that would be the monarchical um the imperial kingdom and then you would have the other states that would have their own regional monarchies whether that be principalities you also, that, yeah you'd also get a huge state which is about about the size of Texas or New York in, you know. in population so probably yeah um, so I'd, it, probably also, I'd, probably also divide Calif- I'd probably also divide California into at least two different kingdoms. Yeah, that kind of um, needs to be divided anyway. But who would, be the, uh, who would be the Californians and who would be the Californios? <laughs> Obviously, the base part would be the Californios. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have um, uh, the Habsburgs um, try to find somebody connected to Maximilian to come rule that region. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, get, getting back on topic, I would have every... I'd probably base off population which title I would give the necessary monarch of each state, and they'd all be independent from each other, but you have, like, the Duchy of Dakota, but then you have, like, the Kingdom of Texas just based on size and relative population. I'd pro- probably restore the Kingdom of Hawaii um, just because of historical reasons, um, etc., and go down the list from there. That's plus, how... I the royal... plus, I think the royal family of Hawaii is actually Catholic now. Ooh. I I believe they are yes. So, the base right. Hawaiian monarchy. Thank you very much for speaking, Darth. I will move you down to the audience. Wait, no, 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 oh. no. We don't need to do that because he can and... uh, he can come back up for Barbados after 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 no, whatever well, this new topic is. That he wants to hear. Well, he'll still listen. Okay, our next topic is a little bit of a breaking news topic. Oh. Uh, President Biden. And his administration is weighing the idea of doling out substantial payments up to four hundred and fifty thousand dollar payouts per person to families that were allegedly separated at the border because of pre- former President Trump's zero tolerance policy. Okay, okay, I I know you have. Are they going to include the ones that Obama first? did too? Yeah, yeah, that was what that was exactly what I was going to say. This is something that Obama did. If this is specifically a Trump era thing, I wouldn't be surprised. But it's just, oh my gosh, that's just. Wait, okay, this is. A, I mean, if they include what Obama so did, I don't think we should be giving anything to illegal immigrants, regardless, because they're illegal immigrants. They. <sighs> Okay, this this isn't a political thing, so I think Dark can answer this because I heard somewhere, and I want to know if this is true. Isn't four hundred fifty thousand dollars what they pay out if somebody's killed in combat to the it's, family? Um. Uh. Well, our 
life insurance policy, which literally I could commit suicide and I'd still get my family would still get it. But um, yeah, it it it's literally you can it just you die and you get it and your family gets it. But it's four hundred grand, so it's like it's literally less than what they're handing out God, for this. This is sickening. Yeah. Um, which you get fucking oh, you can get blown up with an IED and. You get blown up by an ID and get less money to your family than these people illegally crossing the border. Yes. And I just view this as the, like, personally, just the expoundment of the idea that you can just pay anybody. It's a cat, it's the whole capitalist mindset that money is all that matters. And, like, you can't buy anything like that. And you're just throwing money at the problem. Yeah. You can't, you can't buy that that officers or that military members life back. I mean, uh, I have, I know people who have lost their lives to that. And the fact that they're getting less money than somebody who's literally illegally crossing the border as we speak is just deeply, deeply saddening. Um, that's, I, that's just horrible. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's dramatic that your family has been separated at the border, but at the same time, you still decided to cross a border illegally without going through the proper channels. And, you know, I get it. Some of these people might actually have a legitimate reason that necessitates them breaking the law. Okay. But, I, I'm sorry, $450,000. And I would like to point out that that you have a right to declare asylum to declare and seek asylum in the United States if you feel the reason to do so. Te however, you have to show up at however you have to show up at your court date, and there's not really much of a guarantee that Wait, you'll show up to your court date. So te technically, just... under international law, um, you can seek asylum, but you have to technically go to the nearest country that is um, uh, at peace. So they're not even doing that, most of them. Yeah, because a lot of them aren't even from Mexico. They're from, like, Guatemala and... And Haiti. Oh, yeah. that, I, 450... I... I... Uh... You know, you could buy an office chair with the military budget. You know, four to fifty thousand dollars that'd get you a decent office chair in the military. <laughs> so, yeah, speaking, yeah, you just the payment, throw out the hold rest on, of hold chairs. on, guys. I have more details. The payments would be made to settle lawsuits brought by the ACLU. The ACLU oh, oh. is asking for three point four million dollars per family. Biden's administration is countering with a $450,000 per person payout, which would total just under a million per family. Oh, hold, In all on, honesty, hold on, hold on. they don't deserve a penny. No, yeah. Not a penny. The, okay, we can't, even, we can't even take care of our own with all this printed currency that the government is, you know, putting out and, you know, you know hurting the poor people of our own country even more. But we can't even take care of our own. And we're talking about providing legal defense for people who violated our law. Technically, okay. the ACLU is not sure. affiliated with the oh. United States government. They're a private entity. Well, and the federal and, the, and Biden has the ability to just hand them money, <laughs> or is this something he's going to actually, you know, pretend to follow legality and you know go through Congress on? Oh man. <sighs> Just... I don't think I've ever gotten this this the journal says, on the show. The Wall Street Journal article says that 940 claims have been filed by those families so far, and that the ACLU is representing about 5,500 children who have suffered some form of physical and or mental trauma due to the separation. So, so let's pull up the calculator quick and um, uh, determine how much money that is per child, at least. So for so wait the child so the child is going to get in that, legal that, defense four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yep, and how many children did they say? Nine hundred and forty claims. ACLU is representing about fifty five hundred children. Fifty five hundred oh times four hundred fifty thousand. That would be. No, that's 
but the four hundred fifty is per person. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, yeah. Oh, so they're representing fifty five hundred children. That that'd be over. That'd be two and a half billion, by the way. Which would be Jesus. which would be which would be one million dollars per family. I just I just. So this is one nonsense. million per family. Fifty five hundred children. Those no, children. I just, no, I just, you know. I clap. Just, I just wanna... This is democracy, boys. Clap. <laughs> just... It's over. It's, we're we, done. We have, it's we, have over. Solved, we're done. we have solved the age old question of governance. I, <laughs> I I'm sorry. I just that's just paying it, it paying. You're funny. paying illegal illegal immigrants. You're paying them. Two, two, two billion battle. dollars altogether. Two billion dollars. Two and a half. Two and a half billion two and dollars. Half, excuse me. I don't want to miss the five hundred million dollars that I missed. <laughs> Two and a half billion dollars. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I mean, uh, I mean, okay, you have a right like, to an attorney. You could, you could just walk in the appropriate areas, immigration areas, and say, "Hey, I want to become a U.S. citizen. Can I do that?" And it'd be perfectly legal. You could legally do that. Four hundred fifty thousand well, dollars to buy your nice attorney. Oh, first step. You get paid for. per kid. Four for not doing that. We're literally incentivizing people to illegally cross the border at this point. I, oh I, my I, god! My gosh, I just here, okay. here, border police, separate me from my child so I can get my four hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I per hope. Per kid, by the way, I hope kid. that this money is at least only going to be used for legal defense. I, I, I don't get me wrong. So, so what okay. legal defense requires four hundred fifty thousand? Yeah, what legal defense requires four hundred fifty thousand dollars? I highly doubt. I, I'm sure there are professional law firms that handle like high celebrity profile divorce cases that don't. Take and I love how this is basically dollars. hush money. This is basically hush money. Like essentially, that's what it is. I and everybody it. was I... mad when like Trump did it, and like. Oh my God! Trump paid hush money to like these people, and now they're literally paying four hundred thousand dollars per kid worth of hush money to these people. I just for I defense what, attorneys, by the way. I don't. I don't know what this. I just we're we're really. I don't know. I mean, fifty thousand dollars. You know that could buy you. You know, pre-pandemic, obviously. Uh, you know, maybe a house or, or something. I guess, but. Four hundred fifty, you know, four hundred thousand dollars for somebody who you know gives their life for their country, versus four hundred fifty thousand dollars for so, for legal defense for somebody for, who broke the law for a foreign I mean, national like, at that for a foreign too. national, right? Like, I mean, like at least with American citizens who have a right to an attorney, right? You're an American citizen, okay? And so, and also, there's there's a question as to whether or not you actually did the crime, which is why you need the legal defense in the first place for the trial, but I don't know if you were separated at the border because you crossed illegally. I, I don't think there's really a question as to your innocence or guilt here. <laughs> I mean, all you need to do is if you get deported, go and legally immigrate. Maybe, maybe that, and maybe I'm just stupid. Maybe we shouldn't legally immigrate because of how much you're getting paid. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, moving on to our final scheduled topic of the day. Uh, the Barbados have announced the election of their first ever president, which is which marks the official end of Elizabeth II being head of state of the Barbados, which is an island in the Caribbean, and the forming of the Republic of Barbados. Oh, wow. Our thoughts go out to those who while in the Barbados campaign for the retention of the monarchy there. And we wish those who voted for the Republic, essentially, you, you, you will eventually reap what you sow. Hmm. Mm. You can get what we got. <laughs> you can get- or, or, or they cozy up to um, uh, G 
over there in China. Ooh. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, here's, I mean, here's the thing, right? All these, all these republics, <laughs> all these like former British colonies that like think, oh wow, we're going to be like, just like the U.S. back when the U.S. was prosperous when when we become republics. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Firstly, I think a better example would be India when, when they became a republic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. First thing, America is good because of our natural resources. We can be good in spite of being a republic. That's a that's and our that's thing. Us. And when you deal with other countries that are two people, like European nations that just happen to be republic with like less than a million people per, it's okay, whatever. But when you're dealing when you're dealing with these everybody thinks republicanism is the way to go. They think it's the future, and that's just not true. And history History isn't this constant march towards repu- republicanism. You, you, mean not a way, you mean called a wig history? Yeah. And, and like every person that you talk to, all of my professors say that is nonsense. That is literal, American, democratic, and I mean small d, Republican, Democratic, Republican propaganda. There is no march towards a democratic system there's none of that you can think of that but ultimately when you follow that road of governance if you convince enough people that that's a reality you're going to get people wanting a republic or wanting a democracy and this is what the kind of thing you get um now ultimately and darth will probably agree with me that a semi-constitutional monarchy is probably the best where you have you know, a legislator, you have all this, all these good stuff, federalism, all that good stuff. But when you have a, a nation that has no head, there's no executive, there's an executive every four years. So you get, you know, one guy every four years that's in there for four years. So whatever. Or a lady in this case that just is there and there's no attachment at all. I mean, they're small enough to not get hit super hard by the problems that a republic has. But it's mm-hmm. not going to be good. And it wouldn't be as good as they just decided, hey, let's have a grand prince or something. Or, hey, let's have a grand duke or something. I mean. I can't imagine Grand Duke Harry of Barbados. But... <laughs> oh, yes. Grand Duke. I don't know. I don't know what's, the com- what's a common name in, in Barbados, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, the only the only Barbados person I know is Barbados Slim from Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, anyway, uh, I'm well, aware who's... I'm aware that John has to go, so well, we'll, well, ra- well, so... Well, no, no, no. well, we can we can we can. I mean, yeah, I can sit in. I I, I don't have to go any. I don't have to go super super soon. I'm very okay. close to where I, I'm I guess. Out, so. I mean, we could, we, you know, we should speed it up. Um, I guess, I, 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 I guess I will say, you know, harkening back to the whole Jacobite thing, this is this is sort of a natural, almost a natural consequence of having it a is. monarchy that doesn't actually, like the Queen Elizabeth doesn't really do anything, right? Oh yeah, like, really like, no, well, no, 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 I mean, yeah. well, no, no, no. I mean, you know, when it comes to things like rain, the not general, rule. Yeah. You know, I mean, when it comes to things like the governor general, the governor general, like Canada's, you know, you know, you know, heard recently about you know Canada getting a new governor general and whatnot, but the governor general uh, was was selected by the parliament. The whole point of the governor general was that it w- is that the governor general would be a check on the parliament if the parliament did something stupid, right? Which is sort of what the which is sort of what the queen is supposed to be at home. The queen is basically supposed to be. The Governor General is just supposed to be the exercising influence of the queen uh in the colonial country in question, right, which is why which you know you know the whole uh you know Windsor dynasty versus uh the governor generals the Governor General of Australia actually did dissolve the parliament or did you know call for new elections or whatever when Australia's parliament was going off the rails once, so there you go. the Governor General was doing a better job than queen elizabeth the second um but I mean, the whole thing is that if the monarch doesn't exercise the power, okay, Britain and all the other 
Commonwealth realms are essentially are functionally republics, right? Because any yep. anything the queen does in an official capacity is even is within the basically. British Isles is meaningless. Yeah, like no, I mean, point. yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. The British, you know, the UK and the entirety of the Commonwealth were are essentially functional republics, right? Now there are some passive benefits to having. The mon- the queen there, right, and not just you know the fiscal, you know, all the tourism revenue, but all, but because um, <laughs> but because you know there there are some ties to history, but so there are some passive benefits to having the monarchy, but when the queen doesn't exercise power, right, people will start to wonder why do we have this? So it's understandable why Barbados did this, although the fact that Barbados, um. <laughs> Uh, you know, I yeah, mean, there were, there would functionally no, be no change between no, I mean, a republic and a yeah, quote unquote monarchy. Yeah, no, I mean, and my my my, my spiel is is that um, I haven't looked into the new constitution. I haven't looked into the new constitution, but the I, I'm going to guess that maybe it's it's not going to be said. So, you know, I once again, this could be not the case, but I think that the new constitution uh, may just be like Austria's, where their president doesn't actually do anything, so they just have a president, but he doesn't do anything, right? So functionally, I think nothing will change. But what really, what really bothers me is it is it wasn't like a bunch of new politicians getting elected and then just declaring republic. These were these, all these people who voted for them took an oath to Queen Elizabeth II and her bodily successors. Now, I'm a Jacobite. I don't particularly view Queen Elizabeth II as legitimate in any other capacity than she actually sits on the throne. Uh, so functionally, you know, she's legitimate, but in practical, legal, and whatever. Anyways. But, but they took an oath to her. Okay, an oath isn't something that you break. Okay, th- that's just, okay... Like it's not like the Pope said, "Oh yeah, you know what? This this oath is invalid because the monarch is a bad dude or whatever." Right? This is they they took that oath. Okay, that's part of the reason why I feel like I can't really join the military in good conscience because I'm gonna have to take an oath to the Constitution, which I don't believe in. I I, I just I I I don't know. I I just I I just I just I can't comprehend. You know. Wh- why are your words to defend not not even a piece of paper, right? And I don't want to disparage the Constitution, but you know, a piece of paper. But you're, you know, vowing or, or you know, swearing allegiance to a person, a real person, and you're just breaking that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I've said before, you know, the Constitution should both bring the consent of the governed and the consent of the divine. So I believe that a monarch should be able to rule through divine right through the Constitution in a way. So it's not mm-hmm. like it, – it, it's not – it shouldn't just be a paper. If it's just a paper that the people have agreed upon, then of course it's going to be meaningless. But if you truly make it up to the standards that it would be considered the closest thing, you can get to God approving of this document, or better yet, having it being approved by a church or a, or a majority of the churches within a nation. Then, then by all means, I will follow it. But also, that 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 document symbolizes divine right through the king. So that link between the king and divine right. Unless stipulated otherwise within the Constitution, you see, you know, so it's not it's not like some Congress saying, oh, you're a bad king republic now. It would be like Constitution dictates an impeachment of the monarch would be so and so, so and so murder or something like that. And it wouldn't be it wouldn't be up for debate in a way. But yeah. Yeah. According to the Constitution, there's only one Catholic, holy, and apostolic church. Uh, I, I'd appreciate yeah. that being in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I just, I just, I, I don't know. Maybe you know, people will call me, you know, old fashioned. I mean, in a lot of senses, I am. For crying out loud, I use an iPod Nano from 2006. But it, you know, and people will say I'm old fashioned in my values, but they worked. Okay, these 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 things that a lot of modern people 
we'll say are you know formalities and and whatnot back when people actually regarded them as having some weight they worked okay your 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 allegiance meant something okay it mm-hmm. it was it was you know it was a pretty big deal when somebody would switch size okay because of a bribe or whatever right because if you made an oath to somebody, unless that oath was for whatever reason invalid or the Pope declared it invalid, right? You just you didn't you didn't break that. And if you did, there was legitimate reason to go after you. Okay. And you know legally, and, rightfully speaking, and I, say I think this, yeah. I say this all the time. It you know, saying for the emperor kind of hits different than saying for the president. Or for the Republic, right? The only reason for the, for the Republic, Republic right. is any weight to me is because I'm a Star Wars The Clone Wars fan, so uh, that, I can't remember what was the name of the clone, but, uh, you know, his... For his the Prime Minister! Of... Yeah, for the... Uh, for, 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 for the for Parliament! The, for, 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 the, for the guys who, you know, are involved in another for abuse uh, the President for the has left party. office. Long live the President. Alright. At least for so... four years. I think it's I think it's I think it's time for my last word then we will wrap it up. Okay. Oh. So now it is time for my okay, my last word. Oh. There are several Americans that are currently as far as I'm aware at the time of this recording trapped in Haiti being held for ransom. I have absolutely no idea what their what the hostage what well, what their holders are demanding or so, how this is happening but i hope and pray that they are freed as soon as possible and on a second point you will be listening to this on the feast of all saints happy all saints day to you and yours on this Monday, tomorrow, which means tomorrow, at least in the West, is all, the commemoration of All Souls or All Souls Day. The Vatican has grant has extended the an offer of a plenary indulgence to all of the Catholic faithful who go to a cemetery and pray for the dead on each of the eight day, first days in the month of November. And it is always good to pray for your dead as well as for the dead of others so that those who are in the faithful departed can escape purgatory and enter into heaven. Yeah, and And just like Jesus is with us, so are our dead. They're very much with us. They're in our lives still. And they're praying for us. And yeah, don't forget them. I don't celebrate Day of the Dead during this time. I'm an Eastern Catholic, so um, I much more celebrate regular secular Halloween. So, but my heart is with the Latiners that do do it during this time. And yeah, keep the dead in our thoughts and in our prayers. And it it still counts to pray for them, even if they don't go, you know, to heaven. They're still, God will still move your prayers to somebody else in need. So always keep the, the prayers of the departed in, in, a, in our thoughts because they're with us always. Yes, and do not forget to pray for your dead. And if you have any dead relatives or friends who may have recently died and the in this past year, in these past couple of years, due to COVID or anything else, please put them in the comments section down below this YouTube video so that we can remember to pray for them in this month dedicated to the souls in purgatory, the month of November. And so with that, I would like to close in prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, this day, day our daily, daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, trespasses as we forget as we those who trespass against, against, against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.
Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. And may the perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and all the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, that wraps things up. Don't forget, if you would like to join us live, we go live Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern in the Discord server. Links in the description. That's all the link to all of our other socials. We will see you next week. May God bless you and may God bless the United States of America.